Yeah, Nick wants to fight. Are you willing to give him a fight? Perfect, Scott. What is up, fight fans? We are live, and I love that cut, that sound effect. Burr, 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 burr. Office Christmas party. You guys love that movie, right? That dude has a commercial right now. You know what I'm talking about, the DJ. What an awesome movie, Office Christmas Party, and what an awesome day for us to be here with you. UFC preview, UFC fallout, UFC news, UFC everything right here on MMA Weekly. And it is the time, ladies and gentlemen, the time to be a UFC fan and to keep riding this wave with the greatest sport in the world as we grow, as we're the first back last year, first back this year. And I'll tell you what, man, what an incredible ride it is. And this year, watch, the UFC will reach unprecedented heights. All kinds of great things in the news to start our show today. Jim Greasehopper, call me Grease, along with my buddy Jeff Kane. We are powered by CBD Emporium featuring Level Select CBD, and we are literally powered by level select CBD because that's what I take every morning to get my day going. I use the tincture under the tongue. Three levels for three levels of pain and discomfort, stress, anxiety, having trouble sleeping. Don't worry about it. Level select CBD and CBD Emporium have you covered. They have the roll-ons. They have the creams. They have it all. And let me tell you what, pain relief is a big thing. And I'm 49. I train. I work out all the time. Guys, three kids. I'm working every day doing these shows. It's painful. It's painful sometimes listening to Jeff Kane and all his opinions on this show. And I need that CBD. But I'll tell you what, guys, right now, because you know us, because we love you, MMA50 is the code. Go to stayinthefightmma.com. Buy one, get one free, level select CBD. But don't just take my word for it. Not just me. It's Triple C, the king of cringe. Henry Cejudo, by the way, that new girl, Henry. Nice job, buddy. I'll tell you what, Henry Cejudo, Triple C, the Olympic gold medalist, the two-division champion. He uses level select CBD, and so should you. Stay in the fight, MMA.com, MMA50, buy one, get one free. Also get 30% off CBD Emporium products while you're there as well. They have them with everything in the world, like melatonin, immune support, and all those things. So now that we said that, now that we got that out of the way, now that we told you our best kept secret here on the show, it's time to get to what we all came for, guys. A guy who hasn't fought in five years and a half. A guy who hasn't won in 10 years. His last win was against a guy who just got knocked out at a bar last year. And, uh... This is our lead story. Why, Jeff Kane? One word. Diaz. Except this time, it's not Nate. It's Nick. The ghost has reappeared. Kaiser Soze is back. Or is he? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> According to Dana White, he's he's in talks with the UFC for a fight. Um, who knows, man? Even when Nick Diaz is in fights, he's, he's, he's notoriously one of the guys um, that's not easy to deal with. <laughs> you know? So we'll, we'll see. I mean, we'll see if Nick's going to get back in there uh, and we'll see what Nick looks like after all this time. And we don't we don't really know what he's been doing. He could have been training this entire time and come in here and, um, he, he, you know, teleport across the octagon or or he might have just been hanging out on his bike and not doing any training. So I don't know. It's an interesting story, though. But Nick Diaz still has a name. It's crazy as it is. And, and, and the biggest thing is when he tested positive for marijuana and got suspended, it was the biggest joke in the history of the world. And it always is when there's a marijuana suspension in professional sports. It's been a joke from day one. I mean, talk about archaic and might as well, have, you know, like burning witches at the stake and hanging people in the town square, you know, for things like that, because that's where it should go. And that's where it is going. But Nick Diaz 
Jeff, it's crazy, right? You think about what he may have possibly left on the table here. And we're going to hear from Dana White on this in just a second and Kamaru Usman, who, of course, is the welterweight champ, Nick's division. But Nick Diaz, last fight against Anderson Silva, he lost at UFC 183, January 31st, 2015. Middleweight fight, originally a unanimous decision win for Silva, but he tested positive for a couple of things he shouldn't have tested positive for, performance enhancing drugs that I can't pronounce. Androsterone is one of them. I can pronounce that one. But that one was in January of 2015. Uh, a lot of people thought he beat GSP at UFC 158 in March of 2013. And before that, he lost the unanimous decision to Carlos Condit. His last win against the same guy who got knocked out at a bar by a regular dude last year, BJ Penn. And I love BJ. I shouldn't say that. It sounds like I'm denigrating BJ. But he did get knocked out at a bar. And he is Diaz's last win. Yeah, I mean, people... People love to tear people down, man, when they're at the bottom. B BJ's one of the greatest fighters to ever fight in this sport. Um, he is. One of the, you know, the greatest lightweight. Uh, there, there was no lightweight division. Nobody gave a damn about the lightweight division. The lightweight division was cut from the UFC, and BJ yeah. Penn almost single-handedly resurrected that. Um, and then winning the championship with that flying knee walk-off knockout over Sean Shirk. You know, BJ's a legend, but he's just going through legend. issues right now, man. Uh, but, yeah, that's... <laughs> That's Nick Diaz's last win. I mean, and then you know, there's, BJ Penn's a lightweight. Yeah, he took a couple of fights at welterweight and was was able to win the championship by beating Matt Hughes. But look, BJ Penn's not a welterweight. Uh, but that is, and it was a great win. fight. It was a great fight, Jeff. If you remember it, I think it was fight of the night. Actually, it was it was a really good fight between those two. And it was when BJ was still in his prime. I mean, look, guys stay too long and look at Chuck Liddell. I mean, I don't have to go through the list, guys. I mean. Sometimes guys fight for too long, and that's what you worry about with people like Chris Weidman, you know, and people who just continue fighting. Diego Sanchez out of the co-main event at uh, the May 8th card. Michelle Waterson's now the main event because they also lost the main event, which was Dillashaw. He's got that nasty cut from training. Dillashaw Sanhagen will be pushed back to as soon as possible. And uh, we'll be talking to the Karate Hottie. I'm going to interview her tomorrow right here on MMA Weekly. Speaking of which, guys, hit that subscribe, smash the bell. Right in the chat here, we're going to get to some of your, your comments in just a minute. And, you know, Jeff, that is true. It's a good it's a good point. And, and we're not here to talk about BJ Penn. And we're not here to talk about, you know, um, anything on that line. We're talking about Nick Diaz. But um, fighters do go through issues, and, and especially, you know, toward the end of their career. And, and the money's gone and things like that. And I, I just hate to see that happen to anybody. But BJ Penn, one of the nicest guys I've ever interviewed. And, and a true, one of the first smaller fighters to really become a star in the UFC. And that's what I remember BJ for two division champion people love love bj penn baby j as my buddy mike goldberg calls him but jeff this is about nick diaz and let's hear from the boss man dana white because nick diaz in attendance at the last fight card and sitting there front and center at the post-fight press conference the boss man was asked hey what was nick doing there no sound guys Yeah, Nick was was in There's attendance. There's no sound coming from Dana. Oddly. That's the first time Dana's talking and you can't hear him. <laughs> this is a guest or is there something going on there? Yeah, Nick wants to fight. Are you willing to give him a fight? Sure. Give us a name against who? I will see how this goes. <laughs> Do you have? Is there any time frame? He's waiting for me in the back right now. I'm gonna go talk to him. So. Bring, bring him out here if you want. No, that's okay. all right. <laughs> I'm sure, he wouldn't like that. Bring him out here. I like that. That's the Bring him out here. That's badass. I like it. That was Dana White's thoughts on Diaz was there, and we'll see what happens. And Dana takes that same approach, like, hey, let's see what happens. You know, it's the same with Nate. He said he's offered them both multiple fights over the years, and they're, they've gone back and forth in the media. But if Nick Diaz does come back and fight, Jeff, the fans are the winners, obviously. Every time Nate comes back, and you never have to worry about either one of the Diaz brothers showing up and showing out. You know he's going to be ready. You know how dangerous he is. We're talking about a guy who won four title fights in Strike Force as a champion, you know? So here's a guy who he's a legend in the sport. He's got a huge fan base, a ton of following. And if he comes back, it's good for all of us, man. And why not? The UFC is, is right here, right? It's peaking right now. First back in the pandemic, raising and, and building an incredible business when everybody else was falling, the UFC was rising. And now that fans are back, at least part of the time, you know, obviously you want to sell out those buildings. You want to do everything you can to bring those pay-per-view numbers up. So the Diaz brothers are very, very good for business. And Dana knows that. So the question then becomes, who would Nick Diaz fight? And obviously Diaz is one of those guys who's going to have a big-time fight, maybe not a title fight right away, 
But if we can queue up Kamara Usman, guys, uh, talking about Nick Diaz, we'll throw to that one in a second because he was asked about that after his fight. There it is. Here's the champ, the dominant Kamara Usman talking about the possibility of Nick Diaz. Here and deal with this African lion. Yes. Possibly your division. Any interest? If Nick wants to get in here and deal with this African lion, more power to him. Thanks, Juan. <laughs> African lion. I, he, and he, he is an African lion. You if he does something with Leon coming up here in a few weeks. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. You know, I just heard something about Nick, too. So, you know, you never know. Awesome. Thank you. Ah, there it is. Our MMA Weekly team on top of it, as always, Jeff, man. You know, I mean, Kamaro's no dummy. He wants the money fights. Clearly, Nick Diaz would belong nowhere near a title fight right now, and neither would Nate. But the general consensus, and even DC said it, if Nate Diaz beats Leon Edwards... He's going to get the title shot, and Colby Covington's going to get bumped. Do you agree with Daniel Cormier? Um, probably. <laughs> probably because that's what Camaro will want to do. You, you know, and so the Camaro and the UFC is just going to, you know, uh, Nate's going to sell just as much as Colby, uh, if not if not more. <laughs> you know, and so from the UFC's perspective, yeah, man, th throw Nate in there. Um I could see that happening. I could definitely see that happening. But like I said, a lot because Camaro's already uh, beat Kobe and, and he kind of is leaning towards, you know, it seems like by, by Camaro's rhetoric that he wants to fight anybody, but uh, other than Kobe Covington right now, I don't think he wants to give Kobe another crack at it. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that fight could definitely happen. I agree with DC on that. Yeah, me too. Leon Edwards and, and, is going to have something to say about it, though. Leon Edwards wins that fight. Does he get the title shot? And he, they would never bump Colby for Edwards. Colby, but it's interesting because Colby did they the might. full round of press and interviews, and you know he was at the the front and center in the middle of all it. But the question then becomes, because Kamara Usman's such a dominant champion, and, and Colby's the fight to make. And if Edwards wins, you know you got some people lining up. And Burns fights Wonder Boy. Wonder Boy beats Burns in July. Then Wonder Boy could become the number one or number two contender, and, and he could get a title shot. And we've talked about his style maybe being a little bit of a problem for Kamaru. But the question becomes, Jeff, who does Nick Diaz fight in his comeback, and who would you like to see him fight? If you're, you know, Shelby and Maynard and Dana White, who are you matching him up with? Who are you targeting? Who's tops on your list? I don't, I don't really even think it matters for Nick. It's just about getting him back in there because you're, you're wanting that first fight to be a building fight towards a gigantic fight in the second fight. Um mm -hmm. But you can't give him somebody uh, really highly ranked, y you know. Um, I don't. I don't know who you give him to. You, you know, Robbie Lawler. Somebody, somebody like Robbie. Well, that's a rematch that they've been asked about for a long time, yep. and and they and neither one of them were interested in it before. Of course, we're at different points in our career now. Uh, mm -hmm. I could see them running that fight back. Uh, There's nobody else but, for Lawler to fight to make that much money, right? Yeah, I mean, for for Robbie, that's a, that's probably the biggest fight that he can get right now. For for Nick, I don't think it, it. I don't think the the opponent matters much in the first one. It's going to be bigger in the second one. Uh, but I could see them doing that rematch. I'm just saying that they've been asked asked about that that rematch for a long, long time, and mm -hmm. neither one of the guys have ever wanted it. You know, they're Robbie Lars like, ah, man, I don't care to get that back. You know, and and Nick's like, uh, you know, I don't feel like we have to do that again. Uh, but that doesn't matter. That you know, we're we're at a different point now. Uh, Robbie Lawler's at a different point in his career. Nick Diaz is totally at a different point in his career. So I could see that fight happening. That's a good fight. And then you can run the uh, the highlight reels. I was at that fight where Nick just, he landed that weird jab uh, as Robbie closed the distance and just, <laughs> and that was it. Robbie staggered around and, and got mad that the fight got stopped. But um, they, they could absolutely run that one back. That's probably the biggest fight you could do in that division right now for Nick. Yeah, well, well, actually, I think there's one bigger. I think there's one bigger. I'm going to say it in a minute. In fact, I'm sure there's one bigger. And someone put O'Malley. I don't know why anyone would think that Diaz would fight O'Malley. I think that's what you guys are saying in the chat. He's a welterweight, and O'Malley's, I mean, literally a 135 or so. That's not going to happen. But, guys, I'm going to throw one out, and let me know what you think in the chat. You guys are coming strong today. Jeff, what do you think? I have a name for you right now. The biggest fight you can make for Nick Diaz, a guy who's kind of sliding down a little bit, who's had his title shots who just got knocked out by the champion who already beat Nate Diaz for the BMF. And of course, you know, I could only be talking about Jorge Gamebred Masvidal. What a perfect opponent for Nick Diaz to come back with a huge money fight for everyone. 
I don't, I don't, I don't think that he'll do that. I mean, you're, you're going to want to, you're going to want to put Nate in there, you know, for that one. Uh, you know, if Nick goes in there and beats Jorge, then you lose the BMF rematch. Um, and if Jorge beats Nick, then then you've lost a bigger star. I, I, mm-hmm. I wouldn't do that. I, I, I wouldn't do that. I, would, I mean, honestly, if, I, if I'm the matchmaker, I give Nick Diaz the easiest fight possible. I, I, I call Jeff Kane and throw him in there with him and let, <laughs> and let Nick look really, really good in his first fight. I mean, you know, let him just go out there and, and pound somebody. And then, and then, you know, because, and the reason why Wait, I where's CM because, Punk, the return of CM Punk for yeah, Nick yeah, but Diaz. The reason why I say that is Nick Diaz wins. It doesn't matter who he beats, right? You can beat me in there in, in this return fight. Then everybody's going to be talking, you know, he needs to be fighting for the title. He needs to be doing all that. So Nick just has to get the, the first fight under his belt. You know, that, that, that's going to be the biggest thing for Nick. And I don't think it matters against who, uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put him in there with Masvidal because I think that that takes the luster off the Nate Diaz fight. Maybe, maybe, yeah. I just, I'm throwing names out there and thinking it's got to be a big time fight for Nick to come back. You know, it'll probably be a co-main. It won't be a main. It'll be a co-main on a big card. I'm guessing kind of like Nate is. It's not a big card, Chandler and Oliveira. So they put Nate Diaz on there against Leon Edwards. But if you put Edwards against anybody else almost, and then you have that main event with Chandler and Oliveira, I mean, you could hand people money and they wouldn't buy that card, right? So, I mean, we would, but that card's not going to sell. You know what I mean? You wouldn't get ants to a picnic on that one. So you bring Nate Diaz in, and all of a sudden you have a chance to do a million buys or at least like seven, eight hundred thousand. And that's a brilliant move to help Edwards and help. And we talked about putting a big name on a card with Oliveira so people start to know who he is. And I happen to think that Chandler Oliveira is going to be an incredible fight. Jeff, you were calling for it for a while legitimately you know and and Poirier and McGregor Poirier would rather get another win over Connor and another big payout and fight for the belt later even though we all agree that Poirier would be the champ if there were one crowned right now with Khabib gone so that's pretty interesting there but um when, when I think about man when, when I think about the welterweight division right now and I think about the dominance of Kamara Usman when I think about how great he is and I think about the the, the role that he's on right now that would just be throwing food to a lion. I mean, Nick Diaz is raw meat for Camaro, in my opinion, at this point. Sorry, I was going to get the text. Um, I, I, can you repeat that, Jim? My bad. I said, <laughs> hey, Jeff, you got some Adderall for that ADHD? I, I can relate, man. It happens to me all the time, brother. Um, I said Camaro. He used the lion reference, but feeding him Nick Diaz right now would be like throwing raw meat to a lion. I mean, there'd be, I'd feel like oh. he'd tear him limb from limb. Yeah, I don't think uh, you're going to find a lot of athletic commissions that would that would do that fight. You know, you, Nick Diaz hasn't been in there in basically six years, and then you're fighting the number one guy in the world. I, I don't. I think you're going to be hard pressed to find an athletic commission that would do that fight right now. The UFC doesn't want to do that this? fight. Which fight is this, Jeff? Do you see how know. young Dana is there? Does he have hair? He no, he didn't have hair. But look at him. Look at that. Yeah, that's a young, spry-looking Dana White. And when's the last time we saw him in a suit like that? What are you, like an accountant going to your other accountant's funeral? Dana, I forgot Dana used to dress like that. When's the last time yeah, we saw Dana White in a tie? <laughs> uh, <laughs> a, what, which one was, was These are the kind listen of to his voice. About. Wow, Jeff, so when's the last time, which, which one, which one happened more recently? Dana White wearing a tie or Nick Diaz fighting? Might be, that's a, there's a good question. Probably Dana wearing a tie, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that is. Whenever Nick Diaz fought Robbie Lawler, Dana had hair, so that's not UFC 47. It's a later day. It's probably when he fought GSP, maybe or or something. UFC uh, 53. Young, UFC 53, 53. So it was the, yeah, it was the next one. Uh, that was that. That's a long. That's a long time ago. So Dana actually. Because at UFC 47, Dana had hair. And at UFC 53, he did not. So we're that's the transition period of Dana White. The transi- and now Dana White is the president of a publicly traded company with WME Endeavor and the UFC going public, Jeff, today. 24 bucks a share. 24 bucks. Our guys were guessing 60 in here. 24 bucks a share. You get like Mark Wahlberg, Ben Affleck, Tom Brady. You get all those movies. You get Ari Emanuel. You know, he's the inspiration for Ari Gold and Entourage. You get the UFC. 24 bucks. I mean, with, with the way things are going right now with the UFC and movies coming back and people coming back, 24 bucks. I'm surprised. I, w- I was with our guys who were saying right around the 50 to 60 range. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. 
you know, and I don't think it really matters much as if, if it, if it sells, it sells and then it'll, and it'll split. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't follow the stock market at all. I don't know how much anything is or how much anything's not, I, 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 but apparently the $24 is low, is low for, for what most people were thinking. Uh, so jump in there and buy it, I guess <laughs> if you want to, or don't just depends, bet, bet against it or bet for it. I, I don't, I don't know. Like I said, I don't, I don't follow the stock market that much other than when, other than when the bottom drops out of it. And I'm like, shit, I'm glad I didn't wait to lose all my money because I don't We're all anymore. screwed. No, there's Nick. Look at the young Nick Diaz there at Caesars Palace. Holy crap. That's a long time ago. When was this? This is, this is, is that's this pride. That, that's when Nick Diaz first tested positive for marijuana and they suspended him a year. Uh, oh, that, it's that, pride. There it is. Fought, pride. I see. Yeah, it. that's when he fought. It's pride 32, right? Um, yeah. Nick oh, is there's one, there. uh, Jeff. That's Mahesh. a controversial moment, man, right there. That was a huge controversial moment because Nick Diaz, after he tested positive and was suspended after that fight, said that he'd smoked before every UFC fight, was tested, and never got popped. And then the first time I, he fought outside of the organization, he tested positive for marijuana and was suspended. The fight overturned. Uh, and so Nick made a pretty Nick went Nick went pretty nuts when that happened. And I'm not saying he, he he's uh didn't, didn't have a valid point at the time. I certainly felt like he had a valid point. Nick versus Jake Paul. <laughs> so, yeah, it didn't take long for that in the chat, guys. And Jake Paul was uh, was just on with Ariel, and there was huge numbers. But, you know, Tyron Woodley, Jake Paul went past him real quick. He wants nothing to do with Tyron Woodley, obviously. And he's calling out Nate Diaz now, and he's looking for the biggest names and the biggest money. You know, he's called out. He'd probably call out Nick Diaz next, Jake Paul. But I like what Mahesh says. Mahesh. Uh, ben Chod, I don't know what his, how to say his last name from the chat. Nick versus Diego first, then Nick versus Masvidal. Diego Sanchez, of course, just pulled out of his fight with Cowboy Cerrone. They're looking for, uh, uh, and someone actually asked if Cowboy had fought Robbie Lawler. Yes, that was Anaheim on the Jones DC two card. Robbie Lawler and uh, and Cowboy Cerrone, if memory serves. But uh, that'd be a pretty good rematch. So. Interestingly enough, Jeff, you know, when I think uh, Bobby White, yeah, Nick versus Masvidal, I don't know if it would break all pay-per-view records. I don't know. I don't know if you're beating 1.6, but I think you can get up there with this. I think you'd get over a million. I think that maybe maybe someone like a Diego Sanchez, Jeff, maybe someone who's a big name from Nick Diaz era to kind of stoke the fires a little bit and nostalgia and, and like you said, get Nick Diaz a win and then get him set up for a big fight maybe against a Masvidal because that would do a million buys for sure. Put him in there with GSP. G oh my God. Can you imagine the GSP Nick Diaz rematch? GS I don't think GSP would do it. Do you? He might. I mean, I, I don't think GSP's in the business of fighting the number one guys in the world. I think that that, that part of GSP's life is over. Uh, but you throw B, you throw GSP a big, huge payday and it's against Nick Diaz, somebody he's already beaten. You know, somebody who's not a young up and comer who's who's 25 years old, you know, uh, you, you might see, you, you, you might see George jump on that. Yeah. You, you know, um, I don't know, but that's a, that's a big fight from a name from, from Nick's era. Uh, and that the UFC has been in regularly talks with, you know, I mean, they're, they regularly talk to GSP about fighting to be, uh, you, you know, and then GSP came back not long ago. I, I could, I could see that fight. I, I can't see them throwing Nick in there with a top contender right now. I, All right. I, well, I, let I, me I, ask you. Because we don't know ahead, how Jeff, Nick's going to look. You know, we don't know no. how Nick's going to look. Yep. And and nobody's going to know until he gets in the octagon. Great job by our staff, by the way, throwing up that video footage. Let me ask you this, Jeff. Kamar Usman, right? Champion in the welterweight division. GSP, the greatest welterweight of all time. Kamar was charging hard for that. Would you rather see GSP versus Nick Diaz, GSP versus Khabib, GSP versus Kamar Usman? For the welterweight goat title, GSP versus Diaz, because I think it's fair. You know, I mean, we can't we can't just pull people out of different eras and throw them in in there with the top guys in the world right now. It just it, it isn't it, it it wouldn't be right to throw you know Michael Jordan in there to play one on one with a with LeBron right now. <laughs> you, Although you know, Michael would not, take it, Michael would take it. <laughs> Michael Michael would take a trip to the ER after he got bounced out of the lane. Um, yeah, no kidding. And by the way, that press conference we were just showing, if uh, Bisping, that was one of the best press conferences I've ever been to in my entire life. And you guys know we were all there, right? When Bisping shows up late and drunk 
<laughs> like wasted and he just walks in the in the arena with a mic in his hand as he's coming through the curtain he's shut the fuck up george no he just comes in and does that like a wwe that was so funny um and gsp didn't know what to do he turned red he did, and gsp can't talk trash he's up there going i'm going to video and this big shut up God. it was just amazing amazing but I, I you would rather see gsp who do you guys in the, in the uh in the chat nick versus hall and someone says comms that will beat everyone nick versus masvidal break all pay-per-view records jake paul will get beat by a peanut butter and jelly sandwich <laughs> pretty funny uh, i'll tell you what man i don't know nick diaz and gsp that would be fun but I, I would like to see GSP. I think we're going to see GSP and Khabib this year. I really do. I think we're going to see Khabib come back for the 30, and it's going to be GSP. Kamaru talked about, if I fought Khabib, it'd be the biggest fight of all time. So would you rather see Kamaru fight Khabib? Would you rather see him fight Adesanya, which he wouldn't do anyway because they're friends, but to, to move up or move down? Because it almost seems like, you, and you've talked about this and you hate this, but it almost seems like you have to be a two-division champion to be a top GOAT Mountain. And, and and that almost isn't fair, right? It really isn't fair because some guys aren't designed to be two division champs, but it almost seems like you have to be. So at some point, we're going to see Kamaru Usman look to get another belt, I think. Question is, would it be up a weight class or down? I mean, you, you don't have to be. You, you know, that's what um, – I mean, fans might see that that way. John Jones is the top pound-for-pound pound fighter in the world. Hasn't fought anybody outside of his weight class. Before he was pound-for-pound pound fighter of the world, Khabib, who's never fought anybody outside of his weight class. And before him, I don't even remember who it was, <laughs> you, you know. Uh, the two division champions are just, and, and I, you know, it, it, they are what they are. I don't think it adds to you at all, especially if you go down, <laughs> you, you know. Uh, I, I don't think it necessarily adds to your pound for pound status or, you know, and Goat Mountain necessarily. Uh, it, it, you know, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you have to. You know, I, and, and Usman still has, you know, he's, he's defended that title four times. He's got people to beat in there mm -hmm. uh he, you know he hasn't cleared out the division yet so I, I don't know that he needs to go up and go down I, but look that's what everybody does as soon as you get to be champion people start talking about well, can fight the champion up higher or the champion down lower um i mean we got weight classes for a reason i don't i don't think that we see khabib come back i i highly doubt we see gsp come back and if you asked me before this press conference whether nick diaz would come back i'd have told you no uh but i guess nick's gonna come back I don't know who the hell he's going to fight, though. Oh, that'll be great, man. This is UFC preview, UFC fallout. We are going to give our predictions, by the way, and talk about this fight card this weekend. Yuri Prohashka, the former Risen champion at light heavyweight, taking on Dominic Reyes, the former title contender. And Dominic Reyes, obviously, it's been a tough go for him lately. And um, we'll see. And, and that takes a little, I think, a little luster off John Jones. I mean, Santos and Reyes, uh, as we see moving forward, and Anthony Smith, these guys are not great fighters. And they push John Jones to the limit. And so maybe John Jones is not what John Jones used to be, although he's still atop the pound for pound. He's still John Jones, still undefeated. So I hope we get a chance to see the Ngannou fight. By the way, if you saw Francis Ngannou's fans in Cameroon, oh, my God, the parade. The police were right around his car. Everybody's coming right up to it. I mean, it literally shut down the whole place, Jeff, when he went back there. And then also in, in, in news with that heavyweight title, Derek Lewis says, point blank, he's got the next shot and he's going to finish Ngannou in the first exchange. So Lewis apparently confirming that he's fighting Ngannou next and Ngannou's parade. What an incredible week it is, you know, for the champion Francis Ngannou, who was actually in Kamaru Usman's corner for Usman's last fight. And so Usman and, and, um, and Ngannou each cornered each other in their last fights. And the, and the last thing I want to add on, on Kamaru and, uh, and Kamaru Usman, he has cleaned out that division but not as champion. He did beat Leon Edwards years ago, not when he was champion. He has beaten Burns. He has beaten everybody there but Wonderboy. Masvidal twice. He's beaten Colby. He's literally beat. He's beaten Woodley. He's beaten everybody there. He just hasn't beaten Edwards since he was the champion. He hasn't fought Wonderboy. So if Wonderboy beats Burns, then clearly Wonderboy has to be the guy to fight him because, you know, after the Colby fight, because he's fought everybody else, unless it's Edwards. It, it, I think it would be if Wonderboy wins and Edwards wins, it'll be Leon Edwards. But if Wonderboy wins and Edwards loses to Diaz, I think it would be potentially could be Wonderboy, but then Diaz could get a title shot right away. So it, it's going to be interesting to see. But as of right now, it's going to be Colby. And that's the fight to make for Kamaru. So that's interesting. But I'll tell you what, if Diaz gets a win, Nick, I wouldn't be surprised to see him get a title shot in his second fight for sure. I mean, you, we, the precedent's been set. It happens all the time. 
I mean, Nick got a title shot off of a year suspension and a loss. You, you yeah. Know, so uh, I think that Nate Diaz is closer to a title shot than Nick because he has a path there because uh, he's taken on the number three guy. Nick doesn't have a path yet. Uh, we, we'll see. We'll see who he faces, uh, and we'll see if he's fighting in the in the welterweight division. I mean, been a been a minute since he's fought in the welterweight division. You know, I mean, Nick's championships in strike force was at was at um, one eighty five. And so, and then most of his fights, uh, I, I think, you know, I don't know. It's probably half and half, really, 170 and 185. So, you know, it kind of all depends on what weight class he's going he's gonna to come into. And, and honestly, it's going to come down to where Nick thinks he can get the biggest fight. You, you know, how, how, what's the biggest opponent I can get at 185 versus the biggest opponent I can get at 170? Um, and I don't know. So maybe we're looking at the wrong thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe we need to be thinking about Nick Diaz in the 185-pound division, vying to get a shot at Israel versus uh, the 170-pound division trying to get to Usman. I thought Nick was the welterweight champ, not the middleweight. I might be wrong on that. No, when he I'm when he sure. beat Frank when he when he beat Frank Shamrock, it was a middleweight fight. He's held all kinds of titles. You, you know, I mean, he's a, he probably he held the Elite XC. They created that weight class for him. That the the lightweight class was 160 pounds then. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, instead of 155, and it's mainly for Nick. Um, and then, um, I mean, you know, clearly he fought at 170. You know, that's where the Robbie Lawler and stuff came in. But Strike Force, he fought in, in different weight classes. Condit was the interim champ. Yeah, I have it as a catch weight 179, Shamrock and, and Diaz. San Jose, Strike Force, Shamrock versus Diaz. No, yeah, Strike Force, Miami, Strike Force. It says here welterweight champ in strike force, but I don't know. I mean, I think that the, the, the thing is when you get into the octagon in the UFC against these killers that are there now, Jeff, what I'm wondering is five years out, 10 years since his last win, the game's changed so much. I mean, even when Nate comes back, Masvidal beat the piss out of him. I mean, he literally did, right? So when it's, 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 some, it's dangerous. These guys are dangerous now. I mean, they're better than they were when Nick left. It, the game is evolving. You look at just... You know, Nganu and Adesanya and Usman, the African fighters, and Dana talked about this at the press conference. They're finally emerging. The Chinese fighters haven't even made their market on the men's side, and that's growing. And the UFC has a performance institute in China now. You know, and Zhang, is, of course, was the champion in the women's division. So this is pretty interesting, man. I, I, the game has changed so much. I can't, I, I for one would love to see how Nick can compete against some of the new killers that are coming up right now. And, and changing the game and it's just so different so I, I would love to see how that but but when you're that great at jujitsu and you know he's got an incredible chin and you know going toe to toe and 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 throwing back and forth his jujitsu is incredible so he's got a lot of tools to work with and of course he's been training every time nate fights nick's training with him so you have to assume nick is training with nate every day right now getting nate ready for leon edwards so it is intriguing man iron sharpens iron and you know those two guys training with one another every single day you don't need too many other people when you got a chance to, and your brother's that good. So it, it's a lot of fun just to talk about. But again, we've talked about this for a long time. And when we were talking with the powers that be this morning about the lead story, and then and I heard Nick Diaz, I kind of, ah, it is the lead story always. But my, my first reaction was, man, is he really going to fight this time? Is this just another smoke screen? Is this just another ploy to get publicity for his marijuana? I mean, who knows, right? Who knows with the Diaz brothers? But I know the sport wins every time they go in the octagon. That, that much is for sure. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see what, what happens with Nick, man. I and mean, like I said, Nick's always complicated to deal with. Uh, you, you know, even when he's signed to fight, you're not really sure if he's going to fight. Um, you know, until <laughs> yeah, he shows up. You, you know, and then some, you know, and sometimes he's not even there at the press conferences and stuff. You know, Nick's definitely uh, marches to the beat of his own drum. You, you know, it is dangerous to come back. Um, Nick is not a diverse fighter like Camaro and, 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 this, and the new breed of fighter. Nick doesn't throw a, a lot of leg kicks. Nick, Nick's primarily a boxer who has lost a lot of fights being smothered by wrestlers and a really good jiu-jitsu guy. Uh, but in these, he's going to get into kickboxing exchanges with people where it's a boxer versus a kickboxer. You, you know, and so that's that usually doesn't go well for the boxer. I, I, I would like to see Nick back in there because it's Nick, right? And the fans are going to love it, and he's going to go crazy, and it'll sell out, and, and the press conferences will be gold. <laughs> but yeah. I don't necessarily want to see Nick Diaz compete against the top guys in the world because I don't think he'll do well. You, you know, I, I just don't. I don't, I, don't think that, I don't think you can pluck somebody from that era and put them in this era uh, and, and, and them have success. 
Now people are going to say, did you just say Camaro would beat GSP in their prime? I didn't say that. <laughs> right. uh, but yes, yeah, Camaro would beat, would beat <laughs> GSP in his prime. Yes, he would. I believe he would too. Absolutely. No question. And I, and I say that, you know, GSP is a great champion. I say that with all the respect in the world, but I just think Kamaru Usman is the greatest welterweight of all time. I think he's the best fighter in the world right now. Literally the best fighter in the world. I mean, Valentina and Amanda are right there. Those might be the top three, honestly speaking, in my book, the, the best fighters in the world right now. And, you know, there's so many great ones, but obviously, I mean, geez, you think about what they've accomplished and what they're doing right now. Legendary champions, right? So that's interesting, man. Nick Diaz coming back and the UFC goes public with WME, Jeff, 24 bucks. They failed last year when they tried for the first time. 24 bucks a share for the company that includes the UFC. Of course, the talent agency with Ari Emanuel. Everything's a little shaky in Hollywood. So the price is low, man. Think about that. 100 shares for less than 2,500 bucks. That thing doubles, splits, doubles again. Now you're talking, Jeff. Now you're talking. Makes this a hobby, not a job. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't know that, you know, they, I guess that's a good number, 20, I mean, I guess, you know, everybody seems to be shocked by it, um, yeah, I, I don't know if the, if that's, if Endeavor's a good investment or not, man, I don't, I don't, I don't follow the stock market, I don't, I don't even know that the stock market's real, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't want to sound like Eddie Bravo conspiracist or anything like that, of course the stock market's real, I just don't know how it has a real impact on me, um, but yeah, 24 bucks a share. If you got $24 laying around, go get you one share. And then you can say I'm part UFC owner. Maybe that's what I'll do. Maybe maybe I'll go buy like 100 bucks worth of it, four shares, and then I'll be part UFC owner. And then you can introduce me as Jeff Kane, part UFC owner. Part UFC owner Jeff Kane, that would be really good. Yeah, and, and this is according bucks. to the filings with the Securities and, and Exchange Commission. Endeavor's in the process of acquiring 100% ownership of the UFC, and our our, um, our guy Ken Pishna texted us that this morning. So thank you, Ken, for the input on the show. We really appreciate that. So Endeavor in the process of acquiring 100% ownership of the UFC. Previously, they had owned 50.1% of the promotion. So they're, they're buying out. We've seen this in the news. They're buying out all the investors, and they're looking to take 100% control of the UFC. And I don't know if that includes Dana's shares or not, because they gave him back his 9%, even though they already paid him for it, they gave it back to him to stay. So interesting. And how long will Dana White stay? Who knows? I mean, going through the pandemic, taking the company public, the ESPN deal, opening a PI in China, this dude just keeps on rolling. I mean, it's unbelievable to think from where they came. You've been there every step of the way, Jeff, with MMA Weekly, to think about the things that Dana White and the UFC have accomplished in the short amount, I mean, in 19 years, dude, are you kidding me? They bought it for just over $2 million. 19 years later, it's going public. It's worth eight-plus billion-dollar valuation. Just unbelievable. Unbelievable story. It's a pretty crazy story. It's a pretty crazy story about market manipulation and <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh -oh. driving down the price of the product. The opinions here and those are just and only just pain. Please address oh, no, I'm not, I'm not joking. You, you know, that's, 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 the, the very people <laughs> that the very people that prospered the most off the UFC being illegal bought it. You, you know, the, the UFC, they drove. I mean, that's, that's what happened. You know, the, I mean, the Fertinas were on the board in Reno that voted to, to ban mixed martial arts with John McCain. And they turned around and bought it for two million dollars and then used influence to get it unbanned. And boom, you know, you know, and it's a crazy story about the UFC. But, but to say they bought it for $2 million isn't exactly the truth. They drove the price down to $2 million uh, and then purchased it. So it, it is what it is, man. The, the, the way the, the, way the UFC, UFC history is a crazy thing, man. Art Davey, you know, the, the Gracie started that to sell DVDs, and then Art Davey took it over. And then, mm -hmm. and then uh, you, you know, Zufa came in and changed, and changed everything. Uh, but it's a crazy, it's a crazy story when you look at the whole story about how the UFC started, uh, and, and it was literally just to sell DVDs of jiu-jitsu, to sell crazy DVDs, and then it's become one of the biggest sports in the world. Uh, that it which is, UFC was, was the first one you covered, Jeff? How many how many fights had Dana and them been there before you started covering the UFC? It was right about the same time, even, same year. I don't even right? I don't even know if Dana was there. Was he? We launched in two thousand two, and I think I think um, one of our guys told me. I don't know if it was Ken or one of our other guys said um, it was the same year, but Dana and the Fertitas bought it just like a couple months before we started. I don't know. I don't know the exact history, but we've been there. Which one's which UFC, UFC is the first 33. one you remember? UFC 33. 
There it is. UFC but, 33. Was Zufa Jeff. owners then? I mean, it was all right there at the same time. I remember when Zufa bought it. And Dana were they over. were they the, the owners pay per view event? Because you got to remember the first first pay per view event under Zufa, the the main event got cut off. It ran long, and the pay per view company cut it off. So everybody that bought that event didn't even get to see the conclusion of the main event. Uh, Crazy, yeah, nuts. Talking about buying a company and then having a huge hiccup in your first damn show. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it all happened about the same time. I, you know, I, and people ask me that was data there whenever you started covering the sport. I'm, I, I tell them I don't know. It was close. It was close. Uh, but yeah, probably. I, I don't remember what the first event was with Zufa. It's got to be like UFC 32 or right right in there, right? Yeah, I'm looking right now. Um, UFC 30, maybe? Battle on the Boardwalk? That's the Is first that one that popped up. Well, there you yep, go. The first UFC event is. under the new ownership of Zufa LLC. So we were three events behind Zufa. Right around the same time. What a ride it's been. Think about that. And you're right. They did drive the price down. And I forget who Dana was negotiating with because he remember he managed Chuck and Tito. And that's how Dana started. And you hear all the old stories. But he was negotiating. He's like, you're going to pay my guys more. He's like, we might not even have a show. We're going under. OK, there's nothing I can do. And Dana's like, hmm, hey, Lorenzo rolling in a Benzo. Frank, what do you guys think? Let's do this. Childhood friends. They did it. And look what they've done. But here's Lorenzo for Tita is one of the greatest executives in the history of business. I mean, you think about what he's done in his career with Gordon Biersch and some of the other things, and then with the UFC, and they have the casino money. Their dad, of course, was huge in the casino business. You watch the movie Casino. That was his era when they were pulling the shakedowns in the back rooms, and that old school Vegas, the Fertitas made their money, and they've been on the board, and of course, they were on the, um, you know, I mean, bringing in Mark Ratner, but they were, the Fertitas and Lorenzo was on the board. It was on the commission. So interestingly enough, they were able to work everything through every single thing. It's like a train going down the tracks, Jeff. And you just automatically, as the train's coming, all the tracks come together exactly the way the train wants to go. You know, and, and that's just the way it's been for the UFC from the beginning. But it's it's taken a lot to get them there, man. And, and this is a global business now. And you have superstars all over the world looking at Nganu in Cameroon with his parade, looking at Zhang and what they do in China. Look at what happens when there's a fight in Russia or Ireland or anywhere in the world when the whole place shuts down. It's bigger everywhere else than it is here. And it's huge here. Unbelievable. I mean, there is no ceiling. So yes, I think 24 bucks is a very low price for that stock. And then remember, it's not just the UFC. You're buying stock in that whole company, which represents huge movie stars and you know, people doing movies and TV shows and commercials and athletes and everything else under that umbrella. There's a lot of money coming in in that in that endeavor. No pun intended, right? WME Endeavor goes public today for 24 bucks a shot. Yeah, it'll be interesting. My wife works in the baking industry and, and follows the market, <laughs> you know, and so okay. I'll ask her about it today because uh, I'm sure okay. she's following it and people are, are going to be trying to invest with her today through it. Well, she's uh, the right I'll, person to ask. It'll be it'll be interesting to see what it closes at at the end of the day. Uh, no, and then if the, it the right person steam, asked. Why, wives are never wrong. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> Mine's not. Look at Dana. There he is. Young. Look at Dana, by the way, is getting jacked again. You see how big Dana just got? He's, he's hitting the iron again big time and probably the testosterone. But I'm not one to judge. I'm on it, too. But look at him. Look at him. Look how young he is there, man. Crazy. When you think about the history here, 24 bucks a share. If you can buy Ari Emanuel and Dana White for 24 bucks a share with those two guys, I mean, Patrick White sell, think about that. Think about those three guys and what they've accomplished in their life. You're really buying people. Whenever you buy anything, any investment you make, you're buying people. Even if you buy property, you're buying people to rent or buy it and make a prop. So you're buying people. Would you not buy Dana White, Ari Emanuel, and Patrick White sell right now for 24 bucks a share? I would all day. Well, I think that what we should do is buy a share and then create shows to where we call the UFC matchmakers. And I'm Jeff Kane, part owner of the UFC, Sean Shelby. And I'd like to know why the hell this fight isn't happening. <laughs> and, um, and then Dana, I love you. Right, just call Dana and be like, yeah, I'm part owner of the, I'm, I'm actually your boss, Dana, uh, technically. Um, I'm wanting to know. I'm, ex I'm expecting a full report, Dana, by yeah, morning. <laughs> exactly. I, I need to see the pay per view numbers. I need to see a full disclosure report. Uh, and full disclosure mind, of the salaries and the payouts. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't mind the new shirt, uh, yeah, we, we, we could do a whole show. We could literally <laughs> a do a whole shirt. show like that. Just buy an Endeavor sock 
and then just start calling everyone that the UFC does business with and say we're part UFC owner, which would be true. You know, be like, absolutely, mm. Monster Energy. I'm, I'm part UFC owner. What the hell are you talking about? Uh, I'm one of the owners of the UFC. I'm calling to speak with Ari Emanuel, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, he needs to be held accountable. And, and negotiate. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to call and negotiate with Jake Paul. And be like, I'll break the story. Part <laughs> UFC owner is in negotiations with Jake Paul. And it's just me, Colin. God. Yeah. Oh, it's a public. And you're writing a column at the same I'll time. I'll say that. that it, well, it's also interesting because now that it's a publicly traded business, then we are going to see more transparency in the numbers and everything. You know, they were able to keep everything um, kind of uh, in-house because it wasn't a publicly traded company. Now that it's a publicly traded company, we will get to see those reports and stuff. So it's it's a monumental story. I know we're joking about around about the twenty four dollars and becoming part owner, but but this is a huge deal for the UFC to go public, and it does have implications. You know, you you, can, you have Endeavor trying to take a hundred percent of of the company, and then uh, you know you got people trying to invest it and, and left and right. But in, in but in the future, we who cover the sport are going to have a better insight into the UFC business because they have to give those reports to, to shareholders. And Sasha's you know, question in the chat is a really great. Thank you, Sasha. And we appreciate you. You're always here. Jeff, now that UFC has gone public, is there a chance that it could be censored like WWE? So that question is a great question because it leads me to wonder, will the product get watered down in any way? Will anything change? You know, it's, it's always the work in progress, but as a fan with the overall experience, Will it stay the same now that it's a publicly traded company or what changes, if any, will be made? I mean, it just it's going to come down to personnel, right? As long as Dana's there, nothing's going to change. Uh, it, it, when Dana leaves is whenever you're going to see uh, if, if big changes are going to come, that, that's when it's going to happen. Uh, and, and you're just going to have to follow the personnel of, of who um, who starts being filled in these positions. You, you know what I mean? I mean, if Leonardo DiCaprio becomes the damn matchmaker, yeah, things are going to change. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, but I don't know. I don't know what the WWE censored. I mean, I, I didn't realize they were censored, so I don't know what they mean by that. Um, so maybe they can explain that or you can. I don't, I don't, I don't know what that, how they're censored. What do you mean, Sasha, by the WWE being censored? I don't understand. So, like, once they went public, the WWE changed the attitude a little bit in the attitude era, and they didn't. They weren't as provocative. They weren't. I don't know. What does that yeah, mean? I, I haven't I watched. I, w- I haven't watched the WWE since The Rock and Stone Cold were there. Honestly speaking, like, like <laughs> I, I think, and even a little bit after that, I went to an ECW show when I was doing my national radio show, and they hooked us up with. I, I was backstage with you know like uh, the Big Show and John Cena. That was a, that's the era. Rob Van Dam. So that's what, 15, 16 years ago. So I haven't really paid any attention to the WWE at all since then. And and very little even then. Rock and Stone Cold was the last time because I went to college with the Rock. He was actually the first interview I ever did in my entire career once I hit college at the University of Miami was with the Rock because his father was Rocky Johnson. Pretty interesting story there. But, it, you know, I mean, interesting to me. No one else cares. <laughs> but I, I think, too, you know, and the Rock is a, is a big UFC fan. Brady's a big UFC fan and Mark Wahlberg and Ben Affleck were minority investors until they were bought up. You got a lot of stars with big connections to the UFC. Jacksonville was full of them in that lower level and, and, and near the cage. More and more celebrities being involved with this deal. You're going to see more A-listers more and more all the time at UFC events. And, you know, I think the stock's going to go up. I think it's going to go up a lot. So that's interesting. I, I want to follow it right now. Where is it at? Let's see. Follow UFC stock. Where's the price at right now? UFC stock. Follow live. Yeah, I don't know. But you would think now would be a good time to bet. Look, and I'm, I'm not even going to talk about it. I don't even know why the hell I'm going to try to pretend. I was just, I was getting ready to say, with the world opening back up and the UFC able to bring fans back and stuff, now might be a good time to invest in the UFC because how can they not make money heading into the rest of this year? But then again, like I said, I don't know anything about the stock market. I do not have a business degree, and uh, I usually lose money pretty pretty regularly. Yeah, and they're trying to raise $588 million with the IPO because they're trying to buy everybody else out and take 100%. That's basically. So um, Ari Emanuel, Patrick Whitesell, and Mark Shapiro with Dana White ring the opening bell. It opens at 24 bucks a share. They're trying to raise $588 million. They're They're targeting an enterprise value, Jeff, of $10 billion. So $10 billion is the worth of the UFC, according to the ownership now. And that's incredible because it was 4.2 five years ago. 
that's more than double in five years. And we went through a pandemic for a year. So when you think about those numbers, that's just, it's staggering. 588 million they're trying to raise the valuation at $10 billion. I mean, now, uh, uh, some of that can be the uh, real estate holdings. You know, I mean, they've, they've built the apex. They, they've uh, built a lot of, of centers around the country and the, and the housing market uh, or the realtor, realtor market's gone through the roof, right? I mean, I, I, mm-hmm. I wish I could sell my house right now. The, the price I would get for it sounds amazing until I try to buy a new one. And I realize that that's the point. House, I keep telling all yeah. my friends, if you're going to sell, don't buy Wait to buy. No. Sell now, buy yeah. later. Yeah, that, well, that's the way the market is now. And so I, I imagine that the UFC, a part of their revenue uh, or part of their net worth has gone up because of their their uh, you know property holdings. Um, but that's not going to be billions of dollars, you know. Uh, but, but they do. They have built facilities in a lot of places, and they have the apex out there. Um, I, don't, I don't know, man. That's crazy. $10 billion that the, the UFC is worth, man. That's... <laughs> That's and guess who they brought on as a board me, member? Man. That's absolutely guess crazy who, to me. Jeff, guess who they just brought on as a board member, too? Mm-hmm. I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. We could see UFC Mars One with this dude. I don't know. Who Elon it? Musk. Oh, Elon. UFC Mars, <laughs> baby. Here comes Elon. They nominated him for the board of WME. IMG. Nice. Nice. So yeah. they bring him on board. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man, what they're doing. And I'm all for it because this sport's blowing up and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're right here every step of the way. So when you come and you watch our shows Mondays and usually Wednesdays, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern, and then we're live during all the fights. We'll be live this Saturday. Reyes and Prohashka, we're going to give you our pick and break down that fight card before we wrap it up on the show. Jeff, you got anything else to add on the UFC going public? 24 bucks a share, 10 billion valuation. Dana White, but, Ari Emanuel, Patrick Whitesell, they're looking to raise $588 no, I, million. I just, You've been here 18 yeah. and a half years, 19. Think about that, man. Did you ever think you would see this sport hit $10 billion, the UFC? Not the sport, the UFC. Yeah, and we always talked about it. I think that that's what, what kept the MMA community in the beginning going, is that we all had an unwavering belief from, from Dana to you know Joe Silva and everybody that was working with the UFC and and then, uh, you know, Reed Harris and people that were working in, in other organizations, we all felt I like Reed. back then that, that this is the biggest sport in the world. We just have to get it in front of people that, you know, and, and, and it's going to be the greatest sport. I think that and I think that's why we're still around. Right. Uh, I, I really feel like that first group of people that could not maybe even, you know, further than that. But, the, you know, the pioneers, we, we all believe that, that this was going to be the biggest sport in the world. We all thought it was going to be bigger than the NFL. You, you know, that this, we just got to get it out there. And, and Dana believed that a hundred, hundred percent, you know, the fighters believe that, uh, the, the, the media believed it. And then now, you, you know, the sports gotten bigger and, and it's, it's just a different thing than it was then. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, I remember way back in the day, you know, like I said, if you covered the sport back then and you went into the media center and saw, you, you know, the, the amenities then compared to what you get now it's 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 night and day man it's it's absolutely crazy and then the hecticness you, you know of, of the UFC trying to put together these pay-per-views and these big fight cards and and hold everything together it was just uh to see where they are today is absolutely incredible it's absolutely incredible yeah, but, I, but I thought I thought we would be here I I, I really you did, did wow. think we would be here yeah I think so we you all everybody did. bought into I Dana think- that much from day one that that dude moves no. mountains man him and Lorenzo what a no, combo Dana bought in no no, because the, the sport would have made it without Dana. Uh, it just. But would the UFC be Dana. where it is without Dana? Who, who knows? But who the, knows? the sport, we all knew, and including Dana White, because Probably we not. were around Dana. You, you know, they're, you're talking about 20 people who traveled to UFC events. We all stayed at the same hotels, drink at the same hotel bar. We all took cabs together, all ate dinner together. It was just this 25-person rolling circus of MMA and we all believed, including Dana, that the UFC was going to be this big, you, you, you know. And so Dana bought into the to the sport. Uh, you know, he saw what the sport would, could do, and we all saw what the sport would do. Dana was just in a position a hell of a lot better than we were to to, to influence that happening, and, and he's done a great job at that. Uh, but but I think the sport would be big uh, either way it, it, because it was headed that way. 
you know, uh, or I felt like it was. I felt like we just needed to get it back on pay-per-view, get it in front of people's eyes, get it on network television, and there's no way in hell this is not going to be the biggest sport in the world. But those are the conversations we used to have back then. You know, you're sitting at the hotel bar talking to Dana, and that's what you're talking about, is that we think this is going to be the biggest sport in the world. He's agreeing. Hell yeah. Uh, Dana ain't sitting at the hotel bar with us anymore. (laughs) No. No, not at all. Not at all. He should be buying drinks. He should be buying the drinks at the bar. No. Uh, Every Dana, single tab Dana, should be picked accessible, up. Dana's accessible, man. Yeah, Dana's he more is accessible. accessible than people, than, than, than most other presidents of humongous sporting leagues. You know, Dana's he pretty is. accessible. And even and back then, he was extremely accessible. You know, uh, we didn't get – all of this fame and stuff didn't really happen until the Ultimate Fighter. You, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah there, there were yep. a handful of people who were famous. But Dana wasn't famous. You know, the, the Ultimate Fighter – is where Dana White became famous. You know, he became the face of the sport with the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, he did, in my opinion, because I was around the sport before that. You know, people wanted to see Tito, they wanted to see Chuck, they wanted to see Randy. They, they nobody cared to see Dana. And then the Ultimate Fighter happened, and then all of a sudden, Dana himself is a celebrity. Became bigger than any of the fighters. Jim Greasehopper, Jeff Kane, call me Grease, call him Kane, right here on MMA Weekly, powered by CBD Emporium, featuring Level Select CBD, the finest products on the planet. And I'll tell you what, for pain, stress, anxiety, sleep deprivation, or even just a little bit of trouble sleeping, you want to sleep through the night. As you get older, you don't want to wake up 47 times to pee. You might get a better sleep out of that. And I do, I'll tell you that, without a doubt. The the performance levels have gone up through the roof. The recovery is that much faster, so much better than aspirin, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, and God forbid opiates. Don't take the Vicodin, put down the Percocet, get the CBD. There's no THC in it. It's not going to get you high. It's going to get you high on life, but it's not going to get you high because there's no THC in it, but it will take care of your pain, your stress, and help you sleep. And right now, you get to buy one, get one on Level Select products and 30% off CBD Emporium, so you can put in the code MMA50 to do that at Stay in the Fight MMA. Dot com level select CBD stay in the fight and Jeff um, Hassan Amiri wants to know can you please explain what it means that the UFC has gone public I'll take that one all it basically means is there's an initial public offering on stock they're making it available for you to become a stockholder and however many shares you buy at 24 bucks a pop that's how many shares of ownership you have in the company and and you're not going to be on a board or anything like that obviously you have to buy a shit ton <laughs> But you you will see if that stock goes up, you'll make profits off it. If it goes down, you'll lose money. But it's it's a chance for the company to be traded publicly, traded publicly on the stock market. So that's what it means to go public. That's the first thing. What else? El Ray says, I'm from Italy. Hello, guys. Marvin Vittori, probably a Marvin Vittori fan in the house. He gets the title shot. Whitaker couldn't make the turnaround for June. And Irving Ramirez says, Jeff, I'm a simple man. I see Nick Diaz video. I click. There we go. And is that you? Typing? I, are you typing? I think a lot of people are that way. Look, I'm the same way, right? Nick Diaz, Nick Diaz is either going to be a very entertaining fight or it's going to be such a bizarre interview that you can't look away, right? I always used to say that whenever we would interview Nick. Just ask him one question and then just leave the mic open. You don't have there to ask go. him anything else. He will cover every topic he wants to talk about, say everything he wants to say, and you don't have to ask him a damn thing. You just got to say, how you doing, Nick? Uh, here's the microphone. Nick's entertaining, man. I, I, I like, I like the Diaz brothers. I like both of them. I always have. Um, I like Muhammad Ali LA. He had some good comments the other day and today he put Jeff Jim and he put the emoji with the zipper across the mouth, like telling us to shut up. <laughs> I like that. What is the stock called? Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, 588 million additional stairs. Endeavor will trade on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker EDR. EDR. There you go, Gio. What is the stock called? EDR. And do you guys think it will blow up down the line? Yes, I think it's going to double split and double again. There you have it. And I didn't buy Pfizer stock when I thought that. And I didn't buy Apple stock when I thought that. I didn't buy Bitcoin when I thought that. I'm sick of not buying shit, Jeff. Yeah, well, I mean, if I could (laughs) I I could buy it, but I would still own a half a share of Apple. A third of a share. Of I the- love your idea, Jeff Kane. I love your idea. Hey, um, I'm calling for Dana. This is um. I, it, look, I'm not even me. joking about that. I'm, I'm probably going <laughs> to send my wife a text and say, buy the least amount of stock in the UFC as you possibly can. Hopefully just one share. And then I'll just one throw that share. around all over. <laughs> yeah, I will stand up at a press conference and say, Jeff Kane from MMA Weekly and part owner of the UFC. And Dana, this chair is not all that comfortable. 
the microphone should be a little better. And, it's too uh, hot in here. Yeah, it's a little hot in here. And if you don't mind, somebody bring me a water. I'll get to my question in a minute. <laughs> oh my god! Get to my excuse me, guys. Part owner here coming through. Yeah, boss man. Yeah. Excuse me. Out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go just Michael like show everybody. Up, just show up without credentials or anything, and be like, "What the hell are you talking about? I'm part owner. What, what do you What do you mean? <laughs> of course, I could park you, it down here underneath the stadium in the private. Yeah, what are you talking about? Sasha oh, has man. a great point. We, do you think fighters like Conor McGregor will try to buy some stock and be like, "I'm going to decide who I fight next. I'm an owner." <laughs> Conor McGregor will absolutely buy stock. I, I think. I think they just sold proper twelve. Did you see that? They just yeah, they sold proper twelve million. for six hundred million. Right. Yeah, That's Conor the worst McGregor tasting garbage yeah, how, I've ever tasted in my life. It's gross. How much money are they trying to raise, Jim? Because Conor McGregor might just come out of here and be like, "I'm forty nine percent owner. You get nothing, Endeavor. You tried to buy the whole thing, and I own forty nine percent now." Uh, Ari Emanuel, you'll do nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Who the fuck is this guy? That's what he's saying. He comes, he comes in Lorenzo's back. All of a sudden, Lorenzo comes rolling in with Connor. They're still boys. Like, yep, new owners coming yeah. through. Yeah. But we, I think I think the fans should absolutely do that. That just, that just makes the press conferences so so hilarious, right? When the, when the fans get to ask the people questions and you're like, yeah, excuse me, excuse me, I'm part owner? <laughs> you know, I didn't like that question, Coming John Jones. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, you can't park here. Bullshit. <laughs> I'm parking right outside the press tent, yeah. walking right in. <laughs> God, man, we could. I'm telling you, that could be a hilarious web series right there. That that would absolutely Amazing. be hilarious. Do you imagine? Like, I've 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 cut a deal with John Jones. John Jones is going to fight Francis Ngannou. I, I've cut, and I'm part UFC owner, so I'm going to make it happen. God. This could be fun, man. But like I said, the biggest Where you story going, for Mr. me. Kane? Where are you going, Mr. Kane? I'm going upstairs to get my briefing from Dana White. Does he know you're yeah. coming? No, but he works for me. He needs to make himself available right now. Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? I'm, I'm part owner. I'm here. What, uh, yeah. In fact, you just need to you know, clock out and go home. You don't question the owner. Right? Start hanging your picture on the wall, Jeff. Start, come with a hammer and nails. Put a big picture of yourself up on the wall. Oh, my God. This is my house. Nameplate. Yeah, take Dana's, Dana's nameplate off the door and put Jeff Cade part owner. <laughs> You're removing yeah. Dana's name. I think I'm just. I, am, I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna do this, Jim. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna call, I'm, sharing I'm, your office with me now, Dana. Yeah, yeah I'm just gonna have. I'm just gonna have a shirt that says part UFC owner, and I'm, that's the shirt I'm gonna wear. Put your every right day. under that Art of War sign in his office with all the flags. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. shit. I have Fucking business IKEA cards. Test. Oh my god, man! Get business cards. They start handing out business cards for UFC employees. <laughs> You're making me cry. Part owner. Oh my god, I'm gonna get banned so fast. It's not even funny. Uh, I mean, could you oh imagine this? God. Here's Sean Shelby. You know, I haven't seen you in a long time. Here's my business card, and he looks at it. It says part UFC owner. Oh my god. You, you get Mike in the press conference like we do, and you're like, "Excuse me, I just want to make an announcement as official owner of the UFC. Uh, the main event has been changed." <laughs> Yeah, we've decided to go away from Venom. And we're gonna go. Oh man, this could be. This John Anik, you're fired. Gold. I'm hiring myself. You're done. There's there's YouTube guys out there right now buying one share of stock to do what we're saying. Right, what right now? I guarantee it. Uh, I guarantee. It, 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 well, why don't we beat Jake and Logan Paul to the punch? Literally. Yeah, we'll you know this. Jake. I mean, why wouldn't Jake Paul? You know, it doesn't matter how many shares you buy. Right. Jake Paul just needs to buy one share and then come out and say, shit, I bought the UFC. What are y'all talking about? Oh, my about? God. How do we get a hold of Jake Paul and tell him this? This is brilliant. This is I Jeffrey mean, everybody brilliant. should do it. You know, everybody should. Do it. Mayweather should do it. You know, Connor should do it. Hell, Nick Diaz should do it. Be like, of course I'm coming back. I'm part owner now. Duh. J Jake Paul <laughs> walks in. I'm the president now, bitches. <laughs> God, we're going to have a lot of people arrested is what's getting ready to happen. We're gonna have a lot of people. <laughs> We're giving some off of you. idiots ideas. Huh? Some idiot that's gonna buy one share and storm the apex now because of us. Dad, if you do that, just make sure you get it on film. <laughs> just make sure you film that shit in HD quality because you are going to go viral and it is going to be. And tell him Jeff Kane sent buy. you. Yeah, and then yeah, send me royalties because it was my idea. But yeah, yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> that's fun. But, but from a journalist me. standpoint, I, I like the fact that uh, we're going to be able to look at UFC financial reports 
You, you know, we're going to be able yeah. to see where the UFC is spending money and where they're making money. And that's something that the UFC has kept, a, you know, as a closely guarded secret uh, since Zufa took over and probably before. Um, but now that it's publicly traded, we get that we get a window in there. I mean, you know, outside of our shenanigans of being UFC owners, uh, we, we will get a window in, into the business practices. Uh, I mean, Jim, I'm going, I'm absolutely going to buy some shares of this. And if, <laughs> if, if, if our, uh, if our sound guy is listening, he should do it too. I mean, we can become UFC owners. This is, this is hilarious, man. I mean, this is, this is, this is our hilarious. chance. Yeah, this I mean, is our John chance Jones to take our place buy, top yeah. sports world. Let's go. I'm, Let's pull all of our money and buy as many stocks as we can. I'll tell you that. I just bought, yeah, I just want to buy one so I can say partial UFC owner. I'll even get it out to the percentage, too. Where, like, you flip over I the mean, back of a business card and it says point zero this zero, here zero, 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 one percent owner. <laughs> <laughs> minority shareholder. Yeah, a minority Excuse me, I'm a minority shareholder. shareholder. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, that's just funny, man. That we can do that now. Um, and I'm, I'm absolutely going to try to do that. I don't know how. What's the least amount of stock you can buy? You know, you usually can't buy just one share. You got to buy them in a bundle. Uh, but we'll see. Get all your friends <laughs> together. Buy one share each. Yeah, well, I'm sure that people are buying it. I, I'm sure I could just throw in on somebody else's purchase today uh, and, and and just have one share. <laughs> Fresh Prince of Welfare it, says, I should be an MMA commentator since anyone can now. Who are these guys? I don't know who we are, Fresh Prince of Welfare. That's a good question. And, and anyone can be an MMA commentator. Anyone can be whatever you want to be. Anyone can run a company. Anyone can start a company. Anyone can be whatever you want. So, yes, you probably could and, be and an I'm, MMA yeah. Especially yeah, if I Jim's can. Jim's a commentator. Right. I'm not a... I'm not a commentator. Jim's a commentator. Uh, Jim's a radio guy. How would you describe yourself? What are you? There's a question right Part there. Are UFC owner? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I am. I'm part UFC owner, David. And I, and I want you to address me accordingly. Uh, no, nah, man. I'm just editor, 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 Change the title. Editor. Jeff Kane, UFC owner. <laughs> You have, I'm I making myself making, the vice president. You know, look, like, start holding press conferences from your driveway and shit, <laughs> streaming it. You're like, I'm Jeff K, minority stake owner in the UFC. You're doing we sit-ups like Terrell Owens in the driveway. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. This show just went off the rails today. I don't even care what people say in there. But, yes, anybody can be a UFC commentator or an MMA commentator. Uh, uh, set goals and and start start clicking Clicking it off your checklist, man. You can get okay. There. So here you go in the chat room. Who's more delusional, UFC owner Jeff Kane or UFC <laughs> welterweight number one contender Colby Covington? Which one's more delusional? Did you see what Colby said, Jeff? He saw a lot of weaknesses in Kamaru Usman against. So I'm like, wait, where the fuck did you see a weakness, dude? Like where? <laughs> <laughs> now see, those are the things that I actually like. I don't like Kobe. I, like I don't like really. There's the, Dana with the, hair. There it is. Yeah, and and mask. Ah. And look at the yep. late Charles. Oh, Lewis. Look uh, at that. RIP, buddy. Yeah, um, yes, yeah. I, I, I even forgot what we were what we were saying. It's uh that is some old school video. Who's right more there. delusional, you or Colby? You thinking you're going to walk oh, in as part yeah, of the no. UFC, and Colby saying he saw weaknesses in Kamaru's game. Like, yeah, yeah okay, dude. Yeah, but but when Colby says stuff like that, I actually think that that's funny. <laughs> you know, because Kamaru had a flawless performance, and here's Colby over going, ah, I saw some weaknesses in there. <laughs> It's just yeah. so absurd that you can't take it seriously. But that that Kobe Covington I like. You know, it's it's so absurd, and he yeah. says it, and he says it with a straight face. He doesn't break character. Uh, that Kobe I like. It's the other side of him that I don't like, where he kind of demeans people to to uplift himself. And you know, I don't like when anybody does that. But Kobe is sitting there on the cusp of a title shot, the, the rematch, and look, Kobe probably matches up the best against Kamaro as, as anybody in that division. Minus say Wonder Boy, um, and then, and who knows how how he matches up until you actually put him in there. Uh, but yeah, I think that was kind of funny, right? Yeah, I saw I saw a lot of holes in his game, a lot of weaknesses, and like when the fight was a round and a half, or it didn't even last. It was just one round, right? Did they didn't even get out of the first round? Who was Dana White's stylist back then? Good lord, there's UFC, there's Colby. I mean, say, say what you want, but he had a, he, he's the only UFC fighter to ever have a sitting president call him post-fight. Yeah, that's but pretty that's, amazing. Yeah, but we didn't have uh, 
There he is. You know, we weren't, on the, we weren't on the president's radar until oh, now. Oh, that jacket's yeah. incredible. I want that jacket, yeah. Jeff. I really want that jacket. Look at that thing. Yeah. I'm not For my first official it. act as UFC owner, I'm taking Colby Covington's jacket from UFC 245. <laughs> Yeah. I'm gonna make them. I'm gonna get a suit made from the canvas, from the octagon canvas, and wear it around. Oh, UFC owner. I'm gonna put it go. across the back. Maybe get a robe. Put the Trojan. Put like the a- Trojan ad on the back. Protect yourself at all times. I love that. Yeah. It's the best ad I might ever. Get like a Protect robe. At all times. Like, like a Jake Paul boxing robe. Like a Rocky robe that says UFC owner. Everywhere like the I Connor, to- the Connor Versace yeah. robe that he. Yeah. Yeah. This partial UFC owner. Uh, I mean, we're gonna be good with this, man. I mean, I, I, I you, I'm gonna get banned. That's what's gonna. Happen. I mean, could you imagine if you call in one of those conference calls and they say, "Next question," and you're in the queue, and you're like, "Yes, this is part owner." They're gonna hang up on you so fast. <laughs> I'm wondering what I'm getting for my investment. You guys need to step yeah. up the promotion of this card a yeah. little bit. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Are you <clears> trying <throat> to tell me part ownership doesn't come with a pay per view discount? Because I, I thought I was going to get a pay-per-view discount. We could call in and say all kinds of great. Back in the day, people did. Uh, and, and I know that people who are, who, are, who are working on this show remember those days when we would have those conference calls with the UFC and certain websites would like hack people's emails and get the conference c- call cold. And so they would call in and just start saying outlandish shit. And you would have to, the UFC would, you know, cut them, cut them off. Just trolls, basically. Uh, that was way back. That's how far the sport has come, Jim, is we had, we would get on conference calls for pay-per-view events and some guy call in trolling with the most ridiculous questions about God knows what. And now you have the biggest outlets in the world to be on ESPN. That, that's what I always thought was like the, the mark, right. Uh, is, is when the UFC got on ESPN and we, we, we really made it. Uh, you, know, you know, but they got on Spike, and I was like, ah, Spike was kind of a startup anyway. You know, they, they're just looking for stuff. And then it went to Fuel, and I'm like, well, it's growing. And then Fox, I was like, that's kind of big. ESPN, though, you're like, hell yeah. We're on ESPN now. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that that's big. Not to plug ESPN, but everybody in the world knows who ESPN is, man. Yeah, <laughs> no know? doubt. We have all watched ESPN. I yeah, like they do a ESPN. great job. They what they do is job, a lot different man. than what. We Look, do, ESPN, but... yeah, yeah. First of all, ESPN is such a huge part of everybody's lives. I mean, since I was a kid, yeah. you know, like I yep. used to watch Sports Hitter religiously. Chris Berman, know? Tom Bees. Yeah, they they do such a good job at covering the sport sports over there. They 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 took a you know, I mean, we're talking about big ideas. Could you imagine when they pitched the idea that hey, we want to do a twenty four hour network on sports only? What they were well, just with? yeah. And they They're had a lot of Australian rules football and freaking yeah. rodeo and all kinds of shit on for years. College basketball really made them. If you think, and then Sunday night baseball came along. The college hoops early on for ESPN was huge. They got so many exclusive yeah. rights, and that was really big for them back in the day. And they'd had the game of the week a couple nights a week, and it made Dick Vitale. And yeah, that's pretty but unbelievable. I mean, the first time meetings? I did that, first time in my how- career I did something on ESPN. That was the greatest day of my life. I'll never forget college game day, 2009. They used one of my play-by-play calls from a high school championship game in Florida. And they and I heard it on ESPN the first time. And then throughout the years having, you know, like different little pieces I've worked on and different things like that. When, when your work is on ESPN, it just changes. the. It's a whole new level. And it's unbelievable. Even when it's, so I, I, even when it's not your work. Like I went to <clears throat> when Jamal Mashburn, his last year at the University of Kentucky, I – I got my crystal ball out and I bought NCAA tickets all the way through from the first round all the way to New Orleans. Yep. All the way to New Orleans. And, uh, well, we're in Nashville. And so I have this humongous sign that says Mashville, Tennessee, instead of Nashville. And I got on sports center and I was like, Holy shit. I got on sports center. I got on sports center. Yeah, I got on Sports Center. I ended up Kentucky ended up losing. That's the that's the infamous Chris Weber. The Duke game. Out. Christian Lehner. Yep. Uh no, no. That that year we lost to um Michigan. We lost to the Fab lost Five. Lost to Michigan in the final four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you lost I, to the Fab Five in the final but four. I sold my Nashville. championship tickets. I sold my championship tickets to this Michigan fan for more than I paid <laughs> for the whole freaking lot of tickets all the way up to that date. And then I watched the championship game in a bar, and I saw that timeout, and I thought about that Michigan fan, man. I almost wanted to give him a refund, man. I was like, dude, I'm almost. Sorry. You, <laughs> yeah, I, I did that once too. It was one of the greatest nights of my life. Um, Notre Dame, Florida State, 1990, whatever it was, three. 
we all went out from college. One of my friends, a big ND fan, it was in South Bend and we had tickets and I didn't pay for my ticket. This dude bought us all tickets, but we were getting offered such absurd amounts of money for our tickets that him and his boy, they were big ND fans. They went in, they didn't care if we went in. We sold our tickets, four of us, for 2,500 bucks a pop. And I spent yeah. 500 bucks in that damn bar and still walked out of there with two grand. It was the, one of the, because I hate both teams anyway. I'm a Miami guy. It was one of the best nights of my life. It was one. It was incredible to do that, to be able to score like that and sell your ticket. By the way, the Dark Cloud NC says one share of EDR on Robin Hood. There you go. One share, Jeff. You can do it. <clears throat> I'm, I'm part of the owner. The whole world's changed now. Yeah, the world changed way. now. Wear a Robin Hood hat in. <laughs> I'm going to do all kinds of stuff, man. I'm going to, yeah. Looks like I'm going to have to try to set up a meeting with all of the uh, the board of directors today. Can get them on there. I decided I'm going to I'm going to work out of the lobby. What are you doing that desk? Oh, I'm make, I'm going to work right out of the lobby. I want to really see what's going on around here. Yeah. I mean, you could uh, you know, whenever you interview Michelle Waterson, I could tell her, "Well, actually Michelle, I'm part owner of the UFC and you know, I could pull that fight. I could I could I could, I pull, could that pull that fight. fight. <laughs> you need to do the interview. If you turn down the interview, no fight. Uh, this is going to be so three much days fun, away and I'm the main event. I don't care. We'll find someone this else. Is gonna be, if Jake Paul, <laughs> of all job. people, if, if Jake Paul doesn't buy stock in the UFC and parade himself around as UFC owner, then he 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 doesn't get it, man. I, I will have think of that YouTube. Spin. If we did this YouTube series, it would. But if Jake Paul did a YouTube series, just outrageous things he would do as a one percent owner or a one shareholder of the UFC. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, Jake, you're yeah. missing I mean, the boat. He would be Jake putting up pictures of his backyard, calling it the UFC Trading Center. You think <laughs> you're making money off the illegal streamers, Jake? You'll make way more off this, buddy. Way more. <laughs> oh yeah, man. I mean, it doesn't even have to be Jake Paul, but Jake Paul would would sell it. It would be. It would just. It's just so Jake Paul, right? I could see Jake Paul doing that, and then keep showing up at UFC events, saying that he's owner. Every time he does an interview, he'll say shit. I made so much money in my boxing fight. I made so much money in my third boxing fight. I bought the UFC. I mean, that should be his, story, his tagline, right? I made so much money in boxing. I bought the UFC. And then you're like, well, how much do you own? Three shares. Circus my ass, Dana. Circus my ass. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what Jake Paul should do. And hey, if Triller ever gets publicly traded, Dana should buy it. And be like, oh, I bought Triller. <laughs> this is good shit man Vince McMahon should do it all these years Vince, I can see Vince McMahon doing it too Vince McMahon coming out and saying well he took over the WCW WWE bought the, the WWE bought he the already WWE took WWE. down Ted Turner he's done it once well I don't think yeah not a power play I'm kind of saying just as a joke because just the PR and the headline right I mean it's just for Jake Paul to say I made so much money in boxing I bought the UFC that's that's I mean, that is gold. That's all day clicks, man. That's all month clicks. And if you had Vince McMahon say the same thing, well, I saw that we went publicly traded, so we, we bought it. <laughs> then that's going to make headlines everywhere. You know, I don't, these guys need better PR, Jim. They need to hire me for, to do their PR because I would have come up with some ridiculousness. Absolutely. Thankfully, ridiculous. you're here and not there. Jeff K and Jim Greeshaber live on MMA Weekly, powered by CBD Emporium, featuring Level Select CBD. Buy one, get one free right now at stayinthefightmma.com with the code MMA50 for the purest and best CBD products on earth. Level Select CBD powered by CBD Emporium. Level Select CBD, stay in the fight. All right, Jeff, we got to wrap it up in a couple of minutes here. But before we do, one more story that we were going to get to here. Let's see. Uh, Ngannou and Oh, I remember Jeremy Stevens not listed in the rankings for you voters after the shove of Jakar Close uh, took away a main event a couple of weeks ago. And we talked about that a little bit before the show. Little Heathen's been around a long time, man, and he's fought a lot of big fights and a lot of big names. But, I mean, his name is gone right now, and, and that can only mean that the powers that be are a little bit pissed off at him for that with the shove at the weigh-ins of Jakar Close. you think about it, you're a fighter, there's a shove, you're just throwing a shove, you're not thinking anything about it, but it's much more, it became much, much more than just a shove at weigh-ins, and it cost the UFC a main event, and now his name is nowhere to be found, is what you told me. I don't see it anywhere. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, you just can't do that. Now, I know that pushing people, but that was, that was, that was a hard shove, man. I mean, that was a hard shove. Gives whole new meaning and, to the phrase when push comes to shove. 
Yeah, and it's just unprofessional too. You know, he cost uh, he cost himself a fight purse. He cost the UFC a main event. He, he cost his opponent, you, you know, a potential at a win bonus and a performance bonus for both of them. You, you know, it's just it's just irresponsible, you, you know, boneheadedness, man, at a weigh in. You, you're going to fight tomorrow. You're going to get paid to fight tomorrow. Why why do you got to push him today? It was just a, it was a, but I I will say this. I'm not going to, you know, bag on Jeremy Stevens for it because tons of people push people at weigh-ins and this doesn't happen. This was just an unfortunate (laughs) situation where his opponent didn't realize he was going to get pushed like that. And when he did, he wasn't ready for it. And it, you know, basically gave him a little bit of whiplash, which I've had somebody push me. I've got whiplash three different times. I got rear-ended in a car. I got hit in football. And then I had a guy push me real hard from behind, and I didn't see him, you know. And it gave me whiplash oh, yeah. in my neck for like, like a couple sucks. weeks. So it's easy to happen, and and you know it, it, it it's it's easy to happen, man. The neck's a crazy thing, right? It doesn't take a lot, uh, and, and and fighters don't fake injuries when they have a, you know thousands and thousands of dollars on the line the next day. Um, He's, but the, yeah, he's I, the hardest pushing guy in the division. Sasha, good job. Remember he said to McGregor, I'm the hardest hitting guy in the division. The hardest yeah. pushing 145er, except Sasha, this fight was at 55. And the Dark Cloud NC says Jeremy is way too hot-headed. And, and it's easy to say, look, it's just a shove. And he's in a, he trains with a good buddy of mine, Orlando Jimenez, out there with Dominic Cruz in San Diego and has for a long time. And, you know, all everything I've heard about him and making phone calls and talking, he's a good dude. He just lost his cool for a brief moment. How many times have you seen a shove? McGregor was trying to kill Khabib at their way in. I mean, it's just something that's really unfortunate. It's hard to keep your cool, but you have to be a professional, man. And certainly Jeremy Stevens never intended for any of this to happen. It was just a push in his mind. And he's being quiet now because there's a potential possible lawsuit, right, Um, with Jakar Close because it cost Jakar Close money. You know, Yeah, there could be. You never know. So he's, he's being quiet. But, I mean, I don't think he should not be in the UFC because of it because no one thinks when you just shove someone that this shit's going to happen. I wouldn't – with all the good that he's done over the years in his career and all the all the great fights that he's been a part of, I would think they'd give him a mully on this one. Yeah, I mean, maybe. It, it, it depends. I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I will say that it wasn't out of, out of the ordinary to see somebody push somebody at the weigh-ins. It was the, it was the injury that was out of the ordinary. So I don't blame Jeremy Stevens. Do I think that fighters should keep their hands to themselves at the weigh-ins? Yes. Uh, for this exact reason. You know, I mean, we saw John Jones and Cormier go at it. Vandalay and Chuck before UFC 79 kind of got into it. And I always thought, man, <clears throat> what if one of these dudes fall off the stage right now? Then the fight's over. You, you know, I mean, I, I never really understood. I understand selling a fight and mouthing off to each other and the one-liners and catchphrases and all of that. But to actually put your hands on somebody before the actual fight Always was seemed irresponsible and risky to me a little. Jones bit. Jones in DC yeah. was the one that I was like, man, someone's gonna get killed. Who was the guy up there? Dave. Dave. Uh, what's his name? He went to the 76ers. He used Dave to do the Dave Scholler. Dave Scholler. Dave Scholler. Yeah, poor dude. He's up there like, fuck. What do I do? Nothing. Get out of the way. <laughs> Move. Yeah. Run. Nothing. Yeah, they're <laughs> no, lucky that they don't make enough money, work. man. And if you don't make five million a year, at least you don't make enough money to get in between those two. I, I mean, my minimum salary for getting in the middle of the two of them. If I'm a $5 million a year guy, maybe I do it, but I'm running the hell out of there. And that, that's the one that I think of the most was that one. Can you think of any other ones? I think that was the biggest one that I remember was Jones in DC. The the whole thing fell well, down. The I stage mean, and, 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 yeah. And then when Connor and, and Nate Diaz were started launching full the water bottles drink, no, those yeah. were full cans. cans. Uh, but that's what, with the John Jones thing, you know what? What what, you, what I immediately thought of is God. I hope no fan got hurt because that's the nightmare, right? Uh, because then you're in a nightmare situation for the promotion, for the fighters as individuals. I mean, the the liability yeah. that you just opened yourself up to, it, it could be incredible. And so that that's what I thought about. Whenever that cage, there were the the stage collapsed and the backdrop fell over, and they both go off to the side. I was like, oh my God, please, none of that land on a fan. Yeah, you know, that sounds terrible, but if it was a UFC employee, that's one thing. The UFC's going to deal with it. If it's a fan, man, that gets that gets really murky and um, and could end careers. So, yeah, I don't, I don't like it. I, you know, I, I like the stare downs. I like to be able to get the photos. I like the hype that it does with the fans. Uh, but, I, but I do think they should put it in the contracts that, that you keep your damn hands to yourself at, at the weigh-ins. Yeah, I'm sure if not. And then Dana White says, hey, that's Sean Shelby's fault. And I'm like, I'm looking at this tiny little five foot seven, 150 pound dude. Like, 
Blame the little guy. I mean, it doesn't happen really when Dane is there. I get, but you I mean look, Dane is right there. He's the president of the company. The fighters probably have nowhere near that level of respect for Shelby. And you know, Stevens got hot headed, and that's a tough thing that that it ended up costing the main event or co-main event. And Jakar close with a big opportunity. Steve, I mean, look. Sometimes when you do shit like that, the one you hurt the most is yourself. He cost himself yeah. his own show money. He went there for nothing. It was an yeah. expense. Yeah, and 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 may have cost himself more. You, you know, I, I agree. You just don't. It's just unprofessional. You, you know, and I don't care how how emotional a fight is or how personal that it's gotten. Your your job. It's, you're you're at your work. You're at your job. You, you know, I just can't go pushing coworkers because, you, you know, uh, unless we sign a fight and then and then in the fight, I guess I can do what I want. But but you know what I mean. The, and I think that that the UFC needs to sit these fighters down and let them know that you are coworkers. You are in a work environment. And until the octagon door is closed and locked and Bruce Buffer's reading the cards, you, you you don't have any business putting hands on each other at all. In fact, I think that they should put it in their contract and fine them if, if they do, just for situations like this. And look, they should, they should know you're an entertainer, right? That's what the weigh-ins are all about, right? They weigh in in the morning. Those ceremonial weigh-ins don't even mean anything. It's all for show for the fans. And the athletes should know that, look, let's get out here. Let's get real close face-to-face. -face. Let's flex our muscles, you know, maybe even oil up so we glisten in the light and then go on. You know, they, they should understand that that's the entertainment side of the sport. And then, you know, the following day, you're actually going to compete. But but they, you shouldn't be taking the weigh-ins as an opportunity to, 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 to push people and kick people. I've got to try to kick, kick that guy. We've seen people punched, you know, Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis. Remember that? Remember that freaking thing that went off? Uh, so yeah, I know they probably need to stay the hell away from each other until you know, or just come to an agreement. I mean, you know, I I, I don't even want to say keep them away from each other like they're animals that can't control themselves. These are grown men. Yeah, you know, walk up, stare each other in the face, shake each other's hand, and walk off. Chicasso Production says, I want to see the fight on fight night. I'm actually not interested in street fights, which is what fighting before the official fight is at that point. I wouldn't call a exactly. shove it wins a street fight, but I get the point, Chicasso. And so I'm, I'm excited. And Jeff, I want to say this real quick and, and move on from this one. One more thing I want to touch on before we get into this card, and we got about five minutes left here, guys. Throw your comments in the chat. Hit that subscribe, that bell. Follow us on every platform or social media. And don't forget, we're live during the fights on Saturdays. We're live every Monday and usually Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern with UFC Preview and Fallout. Jim Greasehopper, Jeff Kane, powered by CBD Emporium, featuring Level Select CBD. And Jeff, TJ Dillashaw out, suffered a cut in training, so this fight with Sanhagen will be pushed back. They're still going to keep that pairing, and who knows when that will be announced. But the new main event, and they also lost their co-main for the May 8th card, Dillashaw is forced out. So now Michelle Watt, and I did confirm this with Michelle and her husband Josh last night on the phone, uh, Michelle Watterson and Marina Rodriguez will headline UFC Vegas 26th on May 8th. They're looking for an opponent for Cowboy Cerrone after Diego Sanchez pulled out. So it's going to be Michelle Watterson and Marina Rodriguez, UFC 26 on May 8th in Vegas. And I will say this, we'll have an interview exclusive with Michelle Watterson on Fight Week. I just got a text from them now. They want to do it on Monday. So we'll have an exclusive Fight Week interview with Michelle Watterson right here on MMA Weekly that I'll be doing. So send us your questions for the Karate Hottie. The biggest thing about this fight, Jeff, the former Adam Weight champ in Invicta, who's already fighting a weight class too big in the UFC at 115, Michelle Watterson will take on Marina Rodriguez at strawweight. And if you remember, everyone was talking about, wow, watch out for this Amanda Hebus. Watch out for Amanda Hebus. Here she comes. Marina Rodriguez says, no, she isn't. Here I come with a big win over her recently that set this up. So the Karate Hottie and Marina Rodriguez, a big opportunity for especially Rodriguez in the main event, but it will be at flyweight, not even straw weight for Michelle Watterson. So 20 pounds above where she fought at in victory. And I, I mean, I wonder if that's just a late notice of it. You, you know, they're like, it, we're yeah. not going to make y'all cut weight. You, you know what I mean? Uh, and so <laughs> it's, it's going to be the same weight difference it, it, no matter what on fight night. Uh, they're probably just not making them cut down. But yeah, man, I mean, that, that's a, it, that fight card's taking major hits, man. Major hits. I mean, you, you basically had a title eliminated eliminator fight main event that got thrown off yeah diego's retirement fight against another legend you know the ultimate the season one ultimate fighter winner uh, you know final fight it, it's canceled and then now we we have michelle waterson stepping up uh to, to headline that fight card props to her props to her on that uh that, that that's a that's a big fight man it's a hell of an opportunity for, a, for an opponent as, as you brought up 
But for Michelle, yeah, I think got, she probably got the call and just said, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, for her opponent, she's thinking, I get an opportunity to make a name for myself off of Michelle Watterson. And it's big money. It's big money for Michelle. She makes good money, and she's got a lot of sponsors, and they pay her a bunch, and she's got, she deserves it. She's hardworking. She's great. She puts in the performance in both these girls. I can't wait for this fight. And like I said, I'll have an exclusive interview. We will here on MMA Weekly with Michelle Watterson, the karate hottie, next week on Fight Week. Really pumped about that. You know, it's it's interesting, you know, when you think about it, that fight card, Jeff, and people say, oh, this fight card, they should just pull it. But you still have Magni and Jeff Neal, Amanda Hill, Angela Hill and Amanda Hebus on that card. You know, Cowboy Cerrone, they're looking for an opponent for him. And then the Karate Hottie is uh, is going to headline it. And that's against Marina Rodriguez. So there's that news uh, about the May 8th card. And now we turn the corner, Jeff. Last thing we're going to do here on the show. And normally we do a full preview, but this event is is a little thin this week for us. And, you know, I mean, it's something that unfortunately is is not a lot of buzz around this card and, and not a ton of interest. And we always say this and they end up being the best fight cards, but Dominic Reyes, a former title contender, so close to beating John Jones. A ton of people thought he did. He got the title fight against Jan Blachowicz, was unable to win that fight and was, was easily dominated and finished in that fight by Jan. And, and of course I use easily loosely. So a two fight losing streak for Dominic Reyes and the former risen champion, Yuri Prohashka, is his opponent this weekend. And for Yuri, it'll be UFC fight number two. He knocked out Volkan Uzdemir in the second round at 49 seconds in Abu Dhabi on July 12th of last year. He beat Steve Dalloway for UFC 20 to defend his championship. He's beaten Fabio Maldonado, who beat Fedor. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, Maldonado won that fight. And he also beat King Mo, Mohamed Luol. So he's beaten some pretty big names and some pretty big fighters. And that, that was uh, avenging a loss to King Mo. But he gets a big chance here against Reyes. And believe it or not, Jeff, Prohashka is actually the favorite at minus 130. And Dominic Reyes at plus 110, the underdog. Yeah, I mean, that, that doesn't surprise me. You know, this is, um, we see it a lot with, uh, with fighters whenever they get to the pinnacle of the sport. They get to the top and fail. They're, they're, they're not the same for a minute. You, you know, and he lost to John, Reyes lost to John Jones and he lost to, to Jan. And it's going to be interesting to see how he looks in this fight. You know, this is, this is where you find out what somebody's made of. Uh, you know, you're, you're facing back-to-back -back losses against the top of the sport. You know, where do you fit in there? You know, and the self-doubt creeps in. Do, do you even belong here? Uh, but Yuri has a huge opportunity right here. Huge opportunity. And, and I think that he should rightfully be the favorite. Because I have questions about where Reyes is. I don't with Yuri. I, I don't at all. I know exactly where he is right now. Yeah, and he's a brutal Muay Thai fighter. He's he's been a heavyweight in the past. I mean, he's he's a heavy hitting, hard punching. I mean, he's a he's a big yeah. dude. Uh, he, he's a he's a problem in this division. I, I really think he's a problem for anybody in this I, division. A big. Problem. I agree. I I agree. I think he's a big time problem. And we'll see what what happens with with Reyes. You know, Re Reyes sometimes looks great. Look, he lost the, to the top two guys to, to the pound for pound great, and the, and then the champion. Uh, you know, and so it's hard to measure where he is right now. You know, he isn't good enough to be the champion, but is he still the number one guy? Uh, and we're going to find out this weekend. And, and I think that Yuri has this huge opportunity to just come in here and he's catching Reyes at a good time as well. Because like I said, it's hard this. to put all that focus on a championship and then come up short. And we see that. I think that's what happened to Gastelum. I, I think that's what's happened to a lot of people. You, you see them make this great run until they get to the championship, and then they lose, and then they kind of have a 50-50 career after that until they find yeah. footing and, and, and get refocused. And so I, I want to see if Reyes is there or if he's able to put that behind him, those losses behind him, and just move forward. Um, this is where we're going to find out has been Dom said. Dominic Reyes is. Yeah, it's been said, Jeff, by by Glover. All you got to do is look at Glover. How many times does that dude come back around? He's got another title shot now. It can be done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, but but uh, you know, the, I, I think this is where you find out where someone's what they're really worth. You know, or, or, or how much how much fights really in them. You, you know, it's 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 one thing I, when you got to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and, and and start from scratch again, man. That's hard to do. That that's hard to do, and it takes a different person to do it and then be successful at it. You know, so we're gonna find out where Reyes is it, it, on that on that spectrum of things. Um, I, I expect since we're at the towards the end of the show, 
I, I, I don't expect Reyes to win this fight. I expect him to take his third loss in a row. Yeah, he, he didn't get finished by Jones. He got crushed by Jan, a loss that looks a lot better now, considering what Jan did to Corey Anderson, who's in Bellator, ready to take on Ryan Bader in that tournament semifinal. And then, of course, you look at what Jan Blahovich did against Israel Adesanya, and everybody was picking Izzy except us in that fight. <clears throat> Excuse me, but when I look at, at Reyes versus Prohoshka, the thing that stands out the most, 18 of his last 19 wins and nine in a row violently finished by Yuri. This is a dude who ends people, Jeff. You look at nine in a row, nine in a row, including King Mo, Fabio Maldonado, CB Dalloway, and Volkan Ozdemir, all in a row, just violently finished by Yuri Prohoshka. Dominic Reyes is, is in the crosshairs. He's being headhunted this weekend. The question is, can Dominic Reyes survive early and fight Dominic Reyes' type of fight? And, you know, the last couple of times out, and again, Blahovich is great, man. Jan Blahovich is great. So you can't really hold that loss against Reyes as much as people were before, thinking, wow, look how great he was against Jones, but then he gets beat the way he did by Jan because Blahovich is proving right now to be a great champ. Yeah, and look, and like I said, it's hard to, to bounce back like that. I mean, he got beat by, he thought he was better than John Jones. He thought he won the fight. He didn't get the nod. Uh, and then he and then he comes back and, and gets a shot at the title again and then, and then loses. I mean, uh, this is a good time to be fighting Reyes because I, where he is right now in his career, it, it's, it's tough to be in mentally. Uh, although he's not far from the top, he's still right there. But, right. but he has to win. He has to win. And he knows that he's not the best in the world. And he's not the second best in the world. <laughs> you know, so uh, it, it's just hard to get motivated and, and, and get back on track to try to get back to show that you are the best in the world. But for, for Yuri, yeah, like you said, he, he finishes people. He hadn't lost a fight since 2015, and he avenged it. The, the common opponent is uh, Ozdemir, where Yuri finished the crap out of Ozdemir, and Reyes took him to a split decision, <laughs> you know, so or to a decision. And so you can read what you want to into that. I know that's some MMA math, and MMA math doesn't always add up. But, but there right. is that caveat. Uh, I, I think Yuri looks good, and, and Reyes drops his third fight in a row is what I think happens on Saturday. I think so, too. I think Prohoshka knocks him out. I think Dominic Reyes, he has great kicks, and that's a big thing for him. He's a tremendously tough dude. So we're both going with Yuri in this fight. And then Yuri's right there in line for a title shot. The co-main ends up being Cub Swanson and Giga Chikadze. And Giga's famous from that head kick by, um, by uh, Buckley, of course. But Cub Swanson, the co-main event, he's been around forever. Ian Kutalabas, the light heavyweights on here against Dustin Jacoby from Dana White's Contender Series. And I like the Mirab Dashvili and Cody Stammen's a pretty good fight, too. Some decent fights on this card, Jeff. Yeah, there's definitely some decent fights on the card. It's just not a huge name value. And then you kind of, you know, you got that adrenaline jump, dump from the three title fights last weekend, you know, and you're kind of going into this and it's just hard to get up for it after that such phenomenal event last week. Um, yeah, there's some good fights in here. And then Cub just got into the rankings because of the, because of the shakeup. He got back in there. Um, this is a, this is a good opportunity for, for Cub. I mean, Cub needs to win. He, you know, he, he snapped a losing streak. He's on a couple of wins right here, but before that, you know, he had a lot of people, he lost four fights in a row and you had a lot of people kind of wondering, is this, is that, is that it for Cub Swanson? And he, now he's put together back-to-back -to -back wins. But this is going to be a tough fight for him. You know, he's going in there against an accomplished kickboxer. I feel like Cub's going to have to actually use his wrestling and submissions in this fight. So we might see a different Cub Swanson than we're used to seeing. Uh, and if we don't see that Cub Swanson, I think he's going to lose this fight on the feet. Yeah, and, and Rockich is in there in the top. Sasha says maybe he fights Rockich next. I don't know. Either one could slide into a title shot. Rockich or Yuri if he wins, or Reyes if he wins, be right there. Again, look at Glover Teixeira getting the title shot, and that division's a little thin at the top right now. So a golden opportunity for both of these guys on the main event. I'm really looking forward to this card. Of course, Jeff will be streaming live. Not sure the start time, but we'll be right here on MMA Weekly. We'll be back on Monday with Fallout, 9 Pacific, 12 noon Eastern. And before we let everybody go, Jeff, and enjoy the rest of their Thursday, heading toward another big fight week with the UFC now trading publicly for the first time under WME, and it was launched this morning. Your final thoughts on whether it be the Diaz comeback rumors or, you know, the, the, the IPO WME endeavor with the UFC, anything, uh, Nganu's parade in Cameroon, Jeremy Stevens, anything we've talked about, anything about this weekend, final thoughts from you. Well, I, I think it was cool to see Francis get that welcome at, in his, in his community, you, you know, um, and it shows how big of a star shows how far 
the sport actually reaches, right? You know, and, and it shows, you know, because we're sitting here with Wi-Fi and internet, and we're doing a live show on YouTube and everything. And man, this sport reaches people in the in the furthest corners of the, of the planet. Uh, and that was pretty cool to see. And it was cool to see Francis kind of uh, be praised for, for his accomplishments. I hope to see Nick Diaz back. I'm interested to see how uh, he looks. And then, Jim, all I really got to say is I'm, I'm, I'm part UFC owner. So, Dana, answer my call. Answer the call, Dana. Jeff Kane's calling. <laughs> He's calling. Man, what a day. Thank you, Jeff, as always. A great job. By the way, keep following everything Jeff and Ken and Hunter and everybody's doing on the website, MMAweekly.com. The numbers are going through the roof. YouTube, we're going to pass 600K subscribers here soon. Let's go, guys. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do it. Keep coming back. Hit that bell. We'll let you know when we have more shows and content coming your way. What a great job by all our people on the show today. Everybody on the website. Of course, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as well. MMA Weekly, the most trusted source in news and entertainment and mixed martial arts since three shows after Dana White and the Fertitas bought the UFC in 2002. For all of those incredible people and everybody at CBD Emporium and Level Select CBD, want to thank them. And again, MMA 50 is the code. MMA50 to get buy one, get one free on Level Select CBD at stayinthefightmma.com. MMA30 to get 30% off of CBD Emporium products. Level Select CBD, stay in the fight. Appreciate all of you being with us here today as we roll into the weekend fight night in Vegas, Reyes and Prohashka. For everybody I mentioned, I'm Jim Greasehopper. Call me Grease saying keep your game tight and your mind right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out.